Good morning, everybody. Uh, fairly heavy morning session in terms of EIRs, um, a lot to take in. Some excellent presentations, so I've got a, a tough gig to follow here. So I kind of took the view, um, I was asked to do the, the how, which is incredibly challenging, really, when you think about it. Um, so myself and um, the, the BDC manager of BAM came up with the title, The Chaos Theory. So we came up with the title before we did the presentation. And I won't lie, um, we str <laughs> struggled to make it work, but we got around at the end, and I'm quite happy with how it turned out, so I hope you, you guys are as well. So, who am I? Um, this is me, apparently. This is how Paul Brennan views me. Now, I don't know whether that's a, an insult or a compliment. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I'm the operations manager for, from a BIM perspective for BAM. So I have roles and responsibilities in terms of all of our current life BIM jobs. My job is to try and help those jobs work, work well. Um, challenging role, um, an exciting role, very interesting role. Um, but uh, I don't have any crystal meth, unfortunately, if anybody is looking for <laughs> So the company I represent, um, I work for BAM Ireland. Um, BAM Ireland has many, many different service companies sitting below it, um, building, PPP, Civil Design International, the list goes on and on. Um, we are part of the Royal BAM Group. So the group itself, oh, my apologies, setting the scene, I'm just skipping ahead here quite quickly. Setting the scene, so the chaos theory it's an interesting scientific theory, so it basically resides around the butterfly effect. Um, and I found this quite interesting. The more we read about it, the more sense it made in relation to the actual construction industry when you, you have a, a long, hard look at this. So the butterfly effect is the sensitive dependence on initial conditions in which a small change in one state of a deterministic, <coughs> nonlinear system can result in large differences in a later state. So everyone think, what in the name of God is he talking about? This is what I'm talking about. This is the best analogy I can come up with. So this is a linear deterministic system. I can be pretty sure, in isolated conditions, that when I push this first domino, that last domino is going to fall. That's the principle. Unfortunately, science has realized that deterministic systems are never deterministic. They do have outside influence, and hence the chaos theory. Any number of things could happen that would stop that last domino falling. In very isolated, well-constructed conditions, it will fall, but I may knock it the wrong way. A cat might run across the table and knock the second one, and the, second one, the last one won't fall. So when we take a stand back and look at construction projects and think about this, we have to execute from start to finish. The end game is to get a building built, but look at the amount of stakeholders we have, the amount of potential variation we could encounter on that process. It's actually incredible. It's a miracle in some ways that we get buildings built at all when you think about it. So what has this got to do with EIRs? A fine question. As I said, construction projects are complex. They involve many stakeholders. They are rarely identical. They do endeavor to be deterministic. Um, but the word there is they endeavor. Randomness is a factor when it comes to construction projects. And last, and most importantly, they carry financial risk. So, you know, we have got good reason to look at EIRs and why we need to framework how it is we are about to execute. It makes perfect sense, really. So, they require the adequate and early engagement with or of the following. Outlining of the objectives and uses of information prior to our commencement. You know, we need to do that. It makes sense. Um, an understanding of the needs of all of the stakeholders. Everybody needs to understand what everybody else needs. I think the previous speakers have already alluded to this. Early engagement with each other. You know, what does my cost manager need? What does the engineer need from me? What does the architect expect from me? What does my client want? The establishment of roles, responsibilities, protocols, and standards. Um, I don't think there is a person in the room who would deny that a good project should have that. And last, but certainly not least, and most importantly, I might suggest it requires competent professionals. You can have everything else above that, but if you don't get a competent professional, it's just not going to happen. So all of these things are so interdependent on each other. If you drop one of those items off that list, it becomes incredibly challenging, <coughs> and chaos reigns. So an EIR is devised to establish this. 
So why is it so important? Ill-considered IRs generally <coughs> lead to chaos, if you even get them. There could be an ask in an EIR which is unrealistic, not achievable, which can cause mayhem, unnecessary mayhem and cost within a project. Um, they need to be written with a view to bringing value to a project. That should be the single most important aspect of this. Again, this has been mentioned by the previous speakers this morning. They need to be written by competent professionals, you know, who understands the requirements being put forth. So this individual should be acting only in the interest of the client, and for all intents and purposes should be completely impartial. You know, it, it, in some instances, probably shouldn't be somebody who's going to be delivering a professional service on the project. There's agendas there. Um, and they need to have an understanding of both construction and operational delivery of buildings. <coughs> that makes sense. That person, you know, those type of people are rare. I know Turner Townsend are, are filling this role in the UK quite successfully. And, you know, you must applaud for that. So, we have to remember as well that, like, as again was said earlier on, not all of our clients know what is good for them when it comes to construction. These people run other businesses. Like, unless it's a property developer, maybe you might have a situation there where they understand construction. But generally speaking, it could be an educational um, body, it could, it could be a car supplier, who knows, wanting to build a new building. They come to us <coughs> looking for professional advice. So try this. And maybe we get a bit of sound. This is what happens in our office when we receive the IRs. This might get quite loud, so bear with me. I'm just helping the deaf and everybody. So it's time for an analogy. But go with me on this. This, go, this goes somewhere, trust me. This is one of the most famous opening scenes of a movie of all time, from 1968, right? Some of you may know it, some of you may not. I know it. I'm a bit of a sci-fi geek anyway, so... This introduction was followed by one of the most famous waltzes ever written. Right? We get there. We have to let it play. <laughs> the waltz was, of course, the Blue Danube. In the movie, you can see now in a second. It's a space odyssey. 1968. Way ahead of its time. If anybody hasn't, hands up who's seen this movie. Okay. If you haven't, get it and watch it. You'll love it. Um, I am going to go with this though, trust me. So where am I going with this? I'm actually more interested in this, to be honest. I'm a keen musician myself, um, and I kind of was thinking, could we draw an analogy of other industries that use structure or requirements to deliver well. Um, music is one of those, you know, sixth sense type things. You know, we've all heard a song where it reminds you of a time and a place and, you know, it just there's something about it. But it doesn't happen by accident. It's not thrown together. So consider this much. That musical score was written in a standard language, which was modern, modern staff notation. That's what this is here. In a long time ago, it was written by Johann Sebastian Strauss. It's a common understanding. All engaging in it understood the language and they knew, they knew how to read it. That's not my phone, by the way. <laughs> Michelle is calling somebody. <laughs> um, the score itself is actually set against time, which I kind of I kind of like. So we're starting to look at you know project deliverable here. It has to happen. Certain things have to happen at certain times. It has many instruments delivering in time and in unison. I'm starting to see the analogy here. It is clear to all what has to be delivered, and it's fully documented. Brilliant. So if somebody fails to deliver, or if it's too early or they're too late, you know, it has consequences. And when it's delivered well, it's music to all our ears. All right. So, is it fair to say that this is some kind of an EIR, maybe an execution plan? Possibly. So, Strauss knew what he wanted to deliver. He documented it in an industry standard. His audible aim required many people to deliver in particular ways, particular times. 
And none of this would have been possible without him documenting his deliverable in a common language that is understood to this day by professional musicians. The music industry has a common <coughs> language, in effect a common data structure. And look how well they deliver. Now, it was nice and simple for them, because they didn't face some of these challenges. Or did they? Unlike an orchestra, the construction industry cannot rehearse the construction project over and over again. So we don't get a time to go out and keep building the same building over and over, and, and we eventually get it right, and then go and perform it in front of people. All the professionals would have worked with and all used and understood the same standard. We, you know, we currently don't. The people delivering for him were trained to deliver in unison and to a plan. And they probably won't have, it probably won't have cost him thousands if a beat was missed. So, unfortunately, cost us. So, there he is. Well, that's not him. Getting back to the first point, though, can the construction industry rehearse construction projects? Yeah, of course we can. That's what BIM is. That's us rehearsing before we deliver. As Ralph alluded to earlier on, we build it virtually once and then we go to site. That's the principle. So, Everybody understanding the same language, can we do this? <coughs> yeah, that's what these standards of documents are. That's what this is all about. Of course we can. we can, we can operate and deliver to a standard. They were all trained to deliver in time and in unison. Are we not? I think we are. We're not making it easy for ourselves at the moment due to the lack of standards and processes, but we are trained to do that. Granted, some professions get about a week in terms of project delivery, you know, but. As a profession, that's what we do, we deliver. And the last one is also commonplace to us, so we suffer from these problems. So he is the information manager. But I felt the analogy was quite interesting because that's a successful industry. Those people deliver well, it sounds music to your ears, it's a beautiful thing. And what are we, you know, we can get there. We are trying to put these standards in place right now, these documents, to allow us you know, maybe to create something which is pleasant to hear or pleasant to look at and everybody's happy with the whole thing, including the client. So the pathway to an adequate EIR. Um, this is a process map that we have inter internally taken and we are working through. So a, a lot of the recent documents that have been released as well have also been included, um, part three, et cetera, et cetera. We want to formulate and, and develop a, a process map internally within BAM where you can come along with your finger, point where you are in a project, and you can see what's gone before you, or at least what should have gone before you, and what's about to come after you. So if we're trying to simplify this, um, the whole process, because you know the four or five documents, they are complex, and when you read through them, you need to kind of break it down. So that's what we're attempting to do. So we should be able to identify along the actual process, which is counterclockwise, where we are, what should have come before, and look at the amount of stuff that kind of comes before you hit construction huge amount of information there that the previous speakers have already alluded to. Um, as Anna was saying, PLQs, AIRs, OIRs, all of this stuff in a perfect world will have happened before the EIR. Plain language questions, incredibly important, incredibly important. Um, the client needs to be assisted in answering these. They may not even know that they need to be answering these types of questions, but they are there, they do assist so before we get to the IR, a lot of stuff has, has got to happen. And as Anna says, it's not always happening. It's not entirely necessary either. It's a bit of a, um, an ideal world here, to be honest. But you know, you will find you're a better place. Within BAM, <coughs> we're a whole life cycle organization. So we take projects from birth right through to FM. So we have been developing our own internal um, OIRs and IIRs. And we, we currently have a data management committee which is looking quite heavily at how it is and to what standards we deliver information management within BAM. So some examples of our EIRs. This is some of the technical content. Again, the previous speakers have already alluded to this quite strongly, and that's, I won't go, I won't bore you to death with it again. But some additional parts that we would include would be our tolerance strategy and our information around BIM 360. Our tolerance strategy, we, we found, um, Again, that was quite important. So prioritizing what is an important clash? When is a clash important? What's its severity? What needs to be looked at? Um, we're, we're great for analogies, but we, we found a lot of the time when, when clash detectors were being performed on projects, our own coordinators themselves are actually finding it very hard to break it down into consumable bytes of information for people to, to deal with. 
it was the whole building versus you know the rest of the whole building and you, you had thousands of clashes and where do you even begin to start so having the ability um, technically um, <coughs> and professionally to understand how to break it down to what matters right now what area of the building are we looking at is it area one is it area two what's the critical systems here from a quantity surveying point of view from a cost point of view what's going to cost us the most money it's having that ability to refine clash detection so we spent a bit of time in our tolerance strategy with our clash detection strategy trying to get that right because we've seen the value there um, our collaboration process again as i said bim 360 we've um we're, we're very heavy users of that so that's quite heavily documented within there as well so here's some images from um from some of our documents as well we we took that document from from cpix and we developed it ourselves um, the commercial stuff we also have QAQC check sheets, so again, as we come to gates and we pass through them, or as information has been released, so there are questions we'll ask our design team. And honesty is always the best policy. We're not saying something is going to be kicked back, because time waits for no man. Um, it just gives us an idea. If they say, yes, we checked this, we checked that, we actually didn't look at those four things, we'll know not to go looking at them ourselves, and, and we'll address it um, after that. So the documents that are available online, like, as Anna's already alluded to, very, very important that you go and get them. Um, the RIEI document is, is available now as well as for consultation. Take a look at it, have a see what it's all about. Um, the competence assessment is quite an interesting one. We uh, bought and used SurveyMonkey. We have taken the CPIX competence assessment and driven it into SurveyMonkey. So when we go to engage with the professional service or subcontractor, we, we push the SurveyMonkey out. They can answer it digitally, and it actually gives us back some really nice statistics as well broken down. So. It very quickly allows us to identify where we need to focus from a training point of view. It, like, we're not in a position right now to be saying to people, oh, you're disqualified from this bid because you can't do this. That's not the reality in this country. The reality is, if somebody is honest enough to say they either don't have Revit or they're not using Navisworks or, or this, that, or the other, we, we, we assist and train. That's what we do. That's what we have to do at the moment in time. And maybe as the years pass on, we'll eventually end up in the mecca where that's no longer required. But we've got to be realistic and pragmatic about it at the moment as well. But that allows us to weed through it, and as Anna was saying earlier on, to get a standard type response is really, really important, because then you can actually <coughs> put metrics again, you can understand, you get the same standard, like these are kind of yes, no, one to five type questions, <coughs> you know, rate your ability between one and five, if we get loads of ones back, we know we have issues in that area, instead of, as Anna was saying, small paragraph, or maybe it's Ralph actually, or a very, very long paragraph of what these people think they might be, or what their competence is in terms of, of Revit. So that has helped us tremendously. We um, do take the time, particularly when we come onto different types of projects, this would be for a PPP, and I'm going somewhere with this, um, where we actually remap our process and we look at how we have to behave there. So we are constantly documenting and formulating how it is we have to execute projects. The reason I'm raising this slide here is because we also have information requirements. We are finding that on some projects where we come on, even if we receive an EIR, it, it, it actually might be insufficient in terms of what's required to deliver BIM to FM, our particular requirements. So we will need to step in and super append our information requirements at that point to allow our software to kind of deliver that as well. So we have BIRs, you heard it here today, BAM's information requirements. Um, but again, it's, we're, we're cognizant of that. We're cognizant of where we need to step in and maybe have more information. And it'll get fed back through to the client and say, look, for us to do this, we require this. So if you want to append it into EIR, by all means. So it's quite important stuff. So an EIR, I, I think it is possibly the single most important document in a project. Possibly. Um, <coughs> it is constantly referred back to at each critical stage to ensure all professionals, all professional services are to the client are delivering to the client's requirements. Makes sense really, doesn't it? It's a gate check. I asked for this, are you giving me that? Yes, you are, okay, on we go. It's actually not complicated. We actually tend to document this stuff anyway. You know, how many professional services have sat with a client and scoped up, you meet them day one, what do you want? I want a school, um, what kind of money, have you got? well I have this money to spend. And You know, you're, you're taking notes, you're actually going to write it somewhere. It makes sense to put this information somewhere in a structured fashion that can then be disseminated to other people. Myself, 
And I'm sure most people in this room will have worked on projects where you don't fully understand the scope, you don't understand what the client wants. You know what you're doing to a degree. You think you know what you're doing. But you don't know the bigger picture. So what is laughable about this is we do it anyway. These documents do not ask us to do anything new. Do not make that mistake. They are just frameworking what this industry should be doing and is purporting to be doing anyway. You know, in a standard fashion. The reason I'm saying it's not complicated is because when people feel it's complicated, there's a fear to use it to get involved. We do it anyway. It is critical to establishing all aspects of design and construction delivery. Critical. Um, we don't want chaos to reign. You know, if we don't tell people what we want from the start, as I already alluded to today, how are they going to deliver for us? And ultimately, it shapes and defines your BIM execution plan. So when I was asked to how, you know, the how you respond, your execution plan is how you respond. And that's going to come at a further session in terms of that. But it shapes and defines that. So in conclusion, poorly thought out or ill-advised, the IRs you know, will ensure that the butterfly effect wreaks havoc throughout our projects. It's hard enough to deliver projects well without having a proper, well thought through plan. There are too many variations of potentials. It only takes a guy in a precast company to be sick for two weeks for us to have a problem. This is the type of thing that I'm referring to here today. There's so much potential for chaos. We really have to try and control it as well as we possibly can from the start. As a client, help your professionals to know the score. As professionals, let's ensure we execute as per the EIR. It's all good and well getting one, and it'd be great to have one, but we've got to deliver as per the EIR as well. So, finally, <coughs> it's so important, I even decided to do a, a Hollywood ending here, and I, I put some credits on. So we're not going to play at all, right? But um, I have actually included all four minutes of the start of 2001 Space Odyssey. <laughs> um, so for those of you who haven't seen this movie, watch it. Um, the Blue Danube plays now. What I would say is, this is a thing of beauty. It's well constructed. It's produced through a standard delivery system. Let's, let's get there ourselves. Let's get EIRs built. Let's use them. Let's formulate proper execution plans to respond to them. And that's all I have to say in the matter. Thank you for your time. <laughs>